You've been seated for a while. Would you just stand, please, and touch the ceiling? <laughs> as far as you can go, let all your abdominal muscles stretch so you can feel it, and your hip muscles, just let them stretch. They want to stretch. You know, ever notice when an animal gets up, the first thing they do is stretch every muscle that hasn't been stretched. And if you have some muscles in you that haven't been stretched recently, would you just do that now? Maybe they're in your seat or in the, the bottom of your feet. Just stretch your toes up. Let your toes touch the top of the ceiling. Okay. Now, I'd like to have you just put your arms down carefully. I don't want anyone to faint. Just, and would you take a deep breath? Very deep, abdominal breath. And let it out. You realize you wasted a lot of good oxygen in that process because you didn't hold it long enough. And some of you did not touch the bottom of your lungs. Most of us breathe up here. Rarely ever to squeak our belt. If you have a belt on, would you squeak it this time when you breathe? Just a deep breath. And I'd like to have you hold it, if you would, so that all the little cells in your lungs can absorb the oxygen. Okay, here we go. Now let your lungs work and absorb all the oxygen. And when you think that it's all absorbed, would you let it out before you faint, okay? <laughs> and one more time, deep breath. All the way down. Absorb all the oxygen. Breathe out the carbon dioxide, the poisons. Because as you breathe out, all the trees breathe in the carbon dioxide. Isn't that nice of nature to do that? So you, they breathe out, you breathe in. You breathe out, they breathe in. <coughs> Works that way. One more time. Now we will not waste the carbon dioxide as it comes out. We will use the carbon dioxide, which is okay to say, praise the Lord, okay? You still got some left? Whatever you have left, just praise the Lord with it when you come out, okay? Praise, praise the, Lord. the Lord. All right, you may be seated, and now your blood is circulating. You can feel your blood circulate. You can, in fact, you can be a great assistant to the circulation of your blood just by the way you breathe. If you want to slow things down, you breathe slowly. Want to speed things up, just breathe rapidly. I have some things that are in my heart I'd like to share with you this morning. Kind of a continuation of last night, but not exactly. Uh, it's another dimension of my learning to walk with the Lord, with the Spirit of the Lord in my life. And uh, you know, I've always had a great love for the Apostle Paul and his openness to the presence of God in his life. There were times when Paul was very aware of the presence of God, and there were other times when he walked by faith and not by sight. And there are times in my life when I'm very aware of the presence of the Lord, and other times when I walk by faith and not by sight or feeling. There are two stories about two roads in the scripture that has helped me greatly in my walk, and I would like to share those stories with you this morning and apply them to my life, and perhaps it will help apply it to your life also. This is the Apostle Paul giving his own account of the Damascus Road experience. Am I getting a ring? Are you getting a ring? Is that me or the microphone? I thought maybe I'd exercise my lungs so much I was giving you a ring this morning from the sound of it. This is Paul's account. About noon, as I came near Damascus, Suddenly, a bright light from heaven flashed around me. I fell to the ground. And we wonder if um, we ever, people ever go under the Spirit. As the Pentecostals call it, slain in the Spirit. That's kind of a negative term, I think, but uh, that's okay. And if they want to use it, that's all right. I, I see it, the Spirit coming upon people, and sometimes you just go to the ground. Such a powerful presence. I fell to the ground. And I heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? I asked. I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. 
he replied. My companions saw the light, but they did not understand the voice of him who was speaking to me. What shall I do? I asked. Get up, the Lord said, and go into Damascus, and there you will be told all that you have been assigned to do. My companions led me by the hand into Damascus because the brilliance of the light had blinded me. A man named Ananias came to see me. He was a devout observer of the law and highly respected by all the Jews living there. He stood beside me and said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very moment, I was able to see him. You know, in my own walk with the Lord, I have had Damascus Road experiences. Not a lot of them, but a few of them. One day I was riding along in my car. I had gone to a meeting. And you've gone to meetings. You know what meetings are like. Uh, this one was one of those meetings that you wish you had been somewhere else. But you had been there all day, and you wondered why you were there when you got there. And before you were there very long, um, you had no idea why you were there. And when you turned the ignition on in your car to go home, you were very glad you were headed home. It was one of those meetings. If you've never attended one, you ought to go to one sometime uh, just to experience it. I was on my way home, and it was kind of a gray day like this. We have those occasionally in Washington. And, uh, and I was, this was the um, Snoqualmie Road for me. I was in Ellensburg, Washington, which is in eastern Washington, going up over Snoqualmie Pass by Mount Rainier. And as I started up this big highway on this gray, drizzly day, I was in the same mood as the atmosphere. And all of a sudden, without any warning whatsoever, there was the presence of Christ in the car with me. The Holy Spirit of God was seated right beside me. It was overwhelming. I didn't know what to do. You know, I've, I've been a pastor a long time, and I have experienced Christ in many ways, but this was the first time I had experienced the living presence seated beside me in the car. And what do you do when the king of the universe is seated beside you in your car? I, the first impulse was to sing. You know, my heart was just singing within me. And it, I didn't hear his voice say it, but I, I felt him saying, you don't need to sing. <laughs> <laughs> and I wanted to uh, pray. You know, when I pray, you don't need to pray. Just drive. So I drove, and there was a there was no conversation like this, Saul, Saul, or Lord, Lord. None of that conversation. It was just the Lord was there. Wasn't any question about it. Uh, there wasn't any verbal communication. The Lord was there, and I knew it. Such joy welled up within me. Such excitement. I didn't even have to turn to look. I wanted so much to turn to look. But there was no need to look because it, was, it wasn't as though he was just there. He was all over inside my car and inside of me. I drove, it was about two hours to Tacoma, where I was to stop for dinner. And I found myself saying, Lord, I hope you like Mexican food because <laughs> I, I love it. And so I stopped at uh, La Mavada to have me a Mexican dinner. And when I went in, my face must have been radiant. I wasn't aware of it. It wasn't as though I was intentionally grinning. I was just on, on fire with the presence of the Lord. And I, I got this idea because as the waitress seated me, she grinned from ear to ear in response to my grin. And she looked me right in the eye and just grinned. I guess she thought I was grinning at her, which I probably was, but I was really grinning at the Lord. And the Lord sat down across the table from me. And we had an awesome conversation without saying a word and I just was aware of his presence and what a table companion and the waitress must have been the happiest customer of the evening for her because I had no arguments whatever she wanted to bring was okay um, and uh, we had our dinner and as we went out and got in the car after the dinner 
I heard the Lord speak audibly for the first time in that ride, and we'd been together about two hours. And the Lord said very clearly, there's a man standing on the other end of the Narrows Bridge, hitchhiking. I want you to pick him up. I'm not accustomed to picking up hitchhikers, unless they're smaller than I am and I can beat them up <laughs> if I need to. But I, my mind said to me, now, you're making this up. But my spirit said to me, this is the truth. And then I said to both my mind and my spirit, well, in three minutes I'll know whether it's the truth or not because <laughs> I'll be over the bridge and if he's there, fine. If he isn't, fine. Okay, I drove over the bridge, but I was so excited about what I would find at the other end of the bridge. I had great expectation in my heart. Drove over the bridge and under the last street light, the big lights hanging out over the freeway, there was a man standing there with his thumb up. I pulled the car over and picked him up. I asked, where are you going? And he said, I'm going to Port Orchard, which is on my way home. And we had gone about 30 seconds down the road, and he says, are you a minister? <laughs> You're telling on me, Lord. Uh, but I said, yes, I am. Why do you ask? And he said, you are the third minister that has picked me up since I left Fort Lewis half hour ago. I said, that's most interesting. Do you think the Lord is trying to tell you something? <laughs> and he said, yes. And I said, what's wrong? Is there something wrong in your life? I, I want to say, the moment that man opened the car door and got in, I did not feel the presence of the Lord anymore as I had before. The Lord had a purpose and he was preparing me for that purpose and as soon as that new step came, that immediate presence of the Lord was not there but I knew in my spirit he was still there in the life of this person. And I said, what is your need? And the man said, I'm afraid. He said, I'm going in for surgery at Madigan Hospital I was in an automobile accident, and my sternum, the chest bone, was caved in. It was popped in, and it's pressing on my heart and my lungs. And I'm going in for surgery, going in tomorrow and have surgery on um, Tuesday. And they're going to put a machine in my sternum and pop it back out. It's a very dangerous thing because it could stop the heart. And he said, I'm afraid. So I took him to his relatives where he was going, his aunt and uncle. He was from back east somewhere. And I said, may I call on you and uh, may I visit you in the hospital tomorrow when you go in? And he said, yes, I, I wish you would. So I went in and saw him on the day before the surgery and then went in for the day of the surgery. We prayed together. He expressed his love for the Lord, his trust in the Lord. And he came through the surgery without fear. And he came through okay. I believe the Lord had something special for me and gave me the privilege of seeing him work in a man's life. But it was an awesome Damascus Road experience for me. And sometimes the Lord's like that. He has something in mind for your life and he will move in and dwell and touch your life in such a, a visible and open way that you cannot miss it. But you know, I've discovered that those are few and far between in my life. Most of the time I'm walking by faith and not by sight or feeling. And I ask, Lord, why is that so? Why cannot I always be um, aware of your presence in my life like that? It was such a, a tremendous time. I didn't even have to ask questions or pray. You just answered it before I even spoke it. Then the Lord led me to uh, another road story in the scriptures. It is not the Damascus road, it is the Emmaus road. And the Emmaus road story is located in Luke 24, for those of you that want to read along. 
beginning at verse 13. This is on the day of resurrection, that glorious day. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. And as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. I think that's an interesting statement. Did God keep them from recognizing Jesus? No. God never hides from anyone. God is a revealer of himself. He always shows himself to people. But they were kept from recognizing Jesus. And Jesus asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? And they stood still, their faces downcast. That's an important word, downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked, Are you the only one living in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have happened there in these days? That's an interesting question because Jesus was the only one in Jerusalem who knew what was happening there in these days. And, but Jesus is so gracious, he says, what things? You tell me what you think has been happening in Jerusalem. What about Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it's the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that he had seen a vision of angels, that they had seen a vision of angels, who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, How foolish you are! And how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. That must have been an interesting conversation to have Jesus explain the old covenant to you, especially all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he were going farther, but they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it's almost evening, the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread, he gave thanks, and he broke it and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. Sometimes you just catch a glimpse of Jesus' presence and then he disappears from your sight. And they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up, returned at once to Jerusalem, and there they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, it is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. And while they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace. Peace be with you. The Lord led me to this scripture to help me understand why there are times when I don't recognize the presence of Jesus in my life. I have been endeavoring for the last several years to practice the presence of Jesus. Not just practice it, but to experience it. To know the reality of it. But there are times when I'm not really aware. I don't see Jesus with me. And I ask the Lord, why? And he brings me to this story, and there are three things in this story, three or four things that have been opened up to me that help me understand those times. The first thing that helps me uh, to understand why I don't see Jesus is what happened to those disciples when Jesus came and walked with them. They did not recognize him, and they stood with faces 
downcast. Have you ever had a downcast face? When you're downcast, that's just the way you are. The cast of your face is down, not up. So you're looking down. When you are burdened, when you are in grief, you do not stand erect. You stand like this, and your face is down. Your whole countenance is down. And as Jesus asked them the question, they stood there downcast. Their grief was so great, they could not see him. These people had lived with Jesus for about three years, and many of them knew him long before that. But they walked with him as disciples for about three years. And these two, probably Cleopas and his wife, knew Jesus well. And they remembered what had happened on Friday. This was Sunday morning, but they could only remember what happened on Friday. And what happened on Friday, he was crucified. He was killed. They understood death. They had seen death many times. They had seen crucifixions many times. The Romans crucified people in rows along the roads just to keep the population under control. Uh, this was a warning. Don't get out of control or this is what's going to happen to you. And so they had seen death. They knew death. But they did not understand resurrection. Well, they had seen one person resurrected, Lazarus, but Jesus was the one who did that. Now the resurrector was dead. He had been hung on a cross. They had seen him die. And their grief was so great, they weren't aware that he was alive. You know, sometimes in my life, my grief gets so great, I have a hard time feeling the presence of the Lord. About four years ago, in fact, uh, four years ago, a couple of weeks ago, August 8th, our firstborn grandson, Joshua, uh, six years old at that time, about six and a half, went on vacation with his mom and dad, our son and his wife. They were at a little dude ranch in uh, Montana. And this was the first vacation they had taken as a family. They had a month off. They went to our daughter-in-law's parents' place and went out to this little dude ranch where they had ponies on a wheel. You know, there are four ponies on, on these uh, cross bar wheels and they'll follow each other around in a circle like this. They had three children at the time and they put the three children on these ponies and watched them go around in the ring. The manager of the little dude ranch came out and said, uh, these are all tame ponies and uh, if you'd like, you may take, unhook them from the ring and lead them out through the pasture here and the children will enjoy riding more out as they go around the pasture than they would just going around in a circle. So our family unhooked the horses and took them through the gate to the pasture. And just as soon as they went through the gate, the little pony on which Joshua sat bolted and ran. And in the process, Joshua's foot was caught in a lead rope that was on the pony, and he was dragged for about half a mile. Our son is, and the whole family watched this process as they called out to the pony to stop, but it only went faster as horses do. If there's anything hanging loose around a horse, it frightens them, and they run all the faster. Our son is paramedic, and he was the first one to reach his son, Joshua, and he could tell that Joshua had been badly injured and uh, most likely was in the process of dying, which he did uh, about 45 minutes later in the hospital. When we got word of that accident, the grief was so great. It, the first part of grief is denial, you know, just denial. It, it hasn't happened. It isn't true. And your whole inner being just denies the reality of the hurt. I'm sure the disciples must have felt that this just isn't happening. It's a bad dream. This is not God's way at all. And the grief that was with us and our grandchildren was, Oh, no, Lord. Oh, Lord, no. And then the anger of 
and uh, somewhere along the week we'll talk about forgiveness and the part that forgiveness played in, our, in the healing of the family in this hurt. But then, oh God, where are you? You see, where are you, Lord, in all this? We don't see you in this at all. The grief is so great that the presence of the Lord is blotted out. I think probably we've all had experiences like that. Or we may be in the middle of them. Um, when you are downcast and your face is this way, it's so hard to look toward heaven in, a, in, a, in an experience like that. But those disciples, their grief was so great, they could not see the Lord. And I experienced that in my own walk. And the Lord reminds me of that. Larry, when you're in deep grief, it's very hard to see me. But I want to reassure you, I'm there. And the more I go through the deep grief experiences and look back on them, the more I realize the Lord really has been there. And we want to share some of those things through the week of how the Lord has revealed himself to us in our grief. A second thing that happened to the disciples, uh, they made in a statement when he asked them, what things are you talking about? They said, well, you know Jesus of Nazareth. He was a man powerful in word and deed. And we had hoped that he would be the one to redeem Israel. Those disciples had a hope in Jesus. And their hope was that he would redeem Israel. And that hope was crushed. They lost their hope. One of the reasons it was crushed is because it was too small. You see, they had hoped that Jesus would redeem Israel. This little piece of land in the Fertile Crescent on the edge of the Mediterranean Sea and put that little piece of land back up as a nation. Redeem Israel. But God's hope was greater. God's hope was to redeem the world. See, not just Israel, but the United States, Russia, England, and all the rest. That's God's hope. It's to reconcile the world to himself. And their hope was crushed because it was too small. And I find out sometimes my hopes are crushed. And when my hopes are crushed, I have a hard time seeing the Lord. I have a plan and an expectation for life, and that doesn't materialize. Then I wonder, where are you, Lord? Hope is so important to our lives. Do you realize that there are 40% more people who die in the month following their birthday than in the month preceding their birthday. Almost twice as many people die in the month after their birthday than the month before their birthday. And studies have shown, and this is especially true among our older folk, our senior citizens, studies have shown that the reason for this is most people say, most older people say, I just hope I can live until my next birthday. And brothers and sisters, your subconscious has no sense of humor. It doesn't. It just records whatever you express as your hope and expectation. And so when you celebrate your next birthday and you have a great time and all the family goes home, then what's your hope? Your hope has been realized and you've already programmed yourself to die. And so you die the next month. That's an interesting study. But I'm telling my brain and my subconscious and every cell of my being, listen to me, now hear this. I'm going to live to be 115 years old. <laughs> and when that time is up, I'm going to live E-T-E-R-N-A-L-L-Y. -L <laughs> See, because my hope is not in this life alone. If I hope in Christ only for this life, I am of all people most to be pitied, says Paul. But my hope is not just for this life. My hope is for life eternal. And I must begin seeing my life in terms of eternity. And I must live the resurrected life now, not wait till I die to be resurrected. I am already alive in Christ now. And so when I die, when my life is crushed, this physical life is crushed, I live right on into eternity with my Lord. Because eternal life is a relationship. That I have with God. So uh, when my hopes are crushed, the Lord reminds me, is your hope too small? 
Is that the reason it's been crushed? We have a hope for our children. We hope they'll have a happy marriage, raise grandchildren so I can love them for a few minutes and send them home. Those kinds of things, you know, that you just want to do the normal things. And then you, then those hopes are crushed. Your, uh, your daughter's husband files for divorce and they're divorced. And that hope is crushed for her happiness and her, her joy. And so she's single again. And uh, our grandson is, we had all kinds of hopes for that little guy, but they were crushed. But the Lord reminds me, keep your eyes up and on the greater hopes and realize all of this is in my hands and I'll take care of it. When my hopes are crushed, the Lord reminds me that he has a greater hope for me. And another reason those disciples failed to see Jesus is that they were very slow of heart to believe God meant what he said in his word. And I find that when I read the scriptures and God says, this is what I'm going to do and I don't believe it, then I fail to see Christ. But when God says, this is what I'm going to do and I believe it, then I can see what God is doing. When God says, I will never fail you, I will never leave you desolate, I come to you because I live, you live, and I believe that, then I begin to see the presence of Christ in situations that are difficult. These disciples were slow to believe, and Jesus said, you're foolish. You're slow of heart to believe all that God says. And I find in those times when I fail to believe the word of God, I fail to see Jesus' presence in my difficult times. But when I believe the word, then I begin to see his presence. He reveals himself to me. I want to share this story with you because I think it summarizes everything I've been trying to say to you and it's summarized in such a beautiful way in another person's life that it has had an overwhelming impact on my life. We were at a CFO in uh, Alliance two years ago now. And there came to the Alliance camp uh, foster parents, Dale and Maddie Clark. And they brought with them their little foster daughter, Selena. Selena, at that time, was four years old. Selena was born the last of nine children to a family in Hawaii. When she was two years of age, this, the family was non-Christian. They, they did not know the Lord and, um, to my knowledge, did not have any interest in uh, uh, coming to the point of knowing the Lord. But when Selena was two years of age, their home caught on fire. She was in a, a, her crib just behind the Davenport, and uh, her, one of her little brothers was playing with a big cigarette lighter on the Davenport and set the Davenport on fire. And the house caught on fire and it burned down totally to the ground. And the parents were able to rescue eight of the nine children. But they could not get to Selena because she was in the crib right at the hot spot of the fire. When the house burned down, which took very few minutes, and the firemen were there, and everything was cooled down, they went to search through the ashes for the remains of Selena. And in the process, they heard a moan coming out of the ashes, which was amazing to them, because you know that in a fire, the very first breath of the heat can kill you as it scorches your lungs, or the gases which form uh, above the floor level, uh, anywhere above a couple of feet, uh, if you stand and breathe, uh, it will kill you. So they were totally surprised that they heard a moan coming out of the ashes. And they wiped all the ashes away that they could, and they found the charred remains of this little child. When they picked her up, they found that her face had been burned off. She had no nose, no ears. Of course, all the hair was gone, and she had no hands left. They were all burned off. She was burned over the major portion of her body. Only a few little places had not burned. They took her to the hospital to make her comfortable until she would die. They just anticipated that she would die. But Selena did not die. 
And when they saw that she was going to live, then they began to work to help her live. And in the long ensuing months, they went through uh, all the medical skills and gifts that they knew how to use to help restore her. So she was in the hospital several months as they cleaned the skin and grafted and um, helped her to live and survive. When she was brought out of the hospital, the parents rejected her, and that's a long story in itself. But Selena was no longer their child. She, she just wasn't the same. So a foster home was found, and Dale and Maddie Clark were the foster parents, and they were beautiful Christian people. They brought Selena home, and they were going to show her a bulletin from their church, a picture of Jesus. And uh, on the front of this bulletin, as they started to show her the picture and say, this is Jesus, before they could say it, she said, I know who that is. That's Jesus. He's my friend. And the only thing they could get out of her as to how she knew Jesus, because she had not been raised in a Christian home, was that Jesus walked through the fire with her. She saw him in the fire. I want to tell you, brothers and sisters, he'll walk through the fire with you. He'll get right in the furnace with you and walk with you. Well, they loved this little child. They fell in love with her. And they prayed with her. And the pain was so great. Uh, excruciating pain. There's no pain like burn pain. And uh, her little muscles were drawing up. And they have to run her through the stiff exercises, the, the strenuous exercises, to keep her little arms straight and her legs straight. And they'd pray with her. And they found out as they prayed with her, the pain would leave and she'd go to sleep. And so this became their therapy. They would pray with her, the pain would leave, she would go to sleep. And she expected that to happen. When they forgot, she insisted. On one of her trips back to the hospital, they were not there one evening, and she was in excruciating pain, and the nurse came in. And little Selena, now about three, says to the nurse, if you will pray with me, the pain will stop, and I'll go to sleep. And the nurse said, Selena, I don't know how to pray. And Selena said, yes, you do. No, Selena, I don't know how to pray. If Jesus were in your heart, you would know how to pray. So Selena kept on with this nurse. And finally the nurse said, okay, Selena, what do I do? And so she said, ask Jesus to come into your heart. This little three-year-old burn victim brought her nurse to Jesus. So the nurse says, okay, Jesus, come into my heart. And Selena said, now pray for me. I don't know how to pray. Yes, you do. Jesus is in your heart. So the nurse says, all right, uh, Jesus, cause the pain to stop and let her go to sleep. And the pain stopped and Selena went to sleep. The nurse went outside in the hall and broke down and said, God, if you are a God like that, I want you in my life. I saw Selena the second time at a camp in Southern Oregon. Maddie and Dale brought her up to this camp where we were going to be. And and by this time, there had been a love relationship created with Selena. She has these large, dark eyes, and no eyebrows or eyelashes. Uh, she has no nose, so she just has a little ridge around the, whole, the nostrils. And she has no ears, but they have a little ridge around. They'll attach a nose later and ears later. By the time she's an adult, she will have 85% use of her body. I think that's exciting, what can happen. Uh, with God and the medical profession working together. But this dark olive skin, all scarred, she has a little bit of hair around the base of her skull. Uh, that's her womanhood. That's the only way you can tell she's a girl. She's let her hair grow long back there. There's nothing on her head except scars. And don't touch her hair. Uh, 
don't, don't even think of cutting it. A nurse trimmed it one day, and she was not thinking of leading that nurse to the Lord. She was thinking of <laughs> other things for the nurse. But, and those little, no, no hands on her stubby little arms. And, but she and I had fallen in love with each other. And when I saw her the second time, she ran with her little arms outstretched. And, and we spent a lot of time together that week, her just sitting on my lap and, and us playing together. And one night during the uh, sharing time, Dale and Maddie, who were professional musicians, um, Dale sang in country western bars before he was converted. Then the Lord has him singing country western Jesus music. And it's beautiful. And the three of them were up there singing, Dale and Maddie and Selena. Little Selena was in her dress and her little tennis shoes, and she was swaying back and forth with this big grin on her face and all the wrinkles up from the, um, the uh, skin grafts up here. But she was just swaying back and forth singing to the Lord. And you could just see the love flowing out of her eyes. And they sang a chorus, which is very familiar to many people. I will bless thee, O Lord. I will bless thee, O Lord, with a heart of thanksgiving. I will bless thee, O Lord, with my hands lifted up. And she lifted up those little arms without any hands. But with my hands lifted up and my mouth filled with praise, with a heart of thanksgiving, I will bless thee, O Lord. And I watched her standing there with those little stubby arms sticking up in the air, reaching up to God as reaching to her father, blessing him. And oh, how that ministered to me. It took away timidity out of my life. If that little child who has gone through so much, talk about grief. She knew grief that I had never known. Talk about crushed hopes. Her hopes were totally crushed, yet God brought her out of the ashes to give her new hope, even to use her to touch lives for him. And I keep wondering what God must have in mind for that little girl as she grows up with that knowledge of how he's worked in her life. Slow to believe? Not so mean. She's not slow to believe at all. She believes everything God tells her. And there she stood. And I said, oh, Lord, if she can do that, take away any timidity that I have in my heart, even to lifting my hands to you. My hands weigh 4,000 pounds, by the way, when I want to lift them. Somehow, in my denomination, we're not much hand lifters. And it just seemed like they never get up there for some reason. But once I saw little Selena, I had no problems anymore. When they were finished, she came back and she climbed up on my lap. And I was overflowing. I get a little overflowing once in a while. And, and the love just poured out of me to that little girl. I put my arms around her. I said, Selena... I love you so much, and you make my heart so happy. And little Selena looked up over, she had no nose, so she looked up over her nose and into mine and put her little stubby arms around my neck like this, and looking up, and she says, Rary, she has a hard time with her L's. They're all R's. Rary, I love you too, and you make my heart go frop, frip, frop. <laughs> I love children like that. They're so honest, you know. Frop, frip, frop. That little child has walked through the fire, walked through the grief, but it was never so great but that she couldn't see the Lord in it. That little girl has had all her hopes crushed, but they were never crushed to the point where she failed to see Jesus because he revealed himself to her. Sometimes we have our Damascus Road experiences, and those are exciting. They're overwhelming. Most of the time we have our Emmaus Road experiences. The Lord is walking with you, and you're not even aware of his presence until one day he reaches over to comfort you in your grief and to restore you when you've lost your hope, and then you realize he means just what he says in his words. I'll never leave you, and I'll never forsake you. I will be with you always, even to the close of the age. Join with me in prayer. 
Lord, I want to thank you for riding in my car with me. That was a special time, and I remember it with great fondness, great love. You were so gracious to do that, especially in a time when I was kind of gray and uh, felt like the weather around me. You didn't have to say anything. You were just there, and I knew it. Your spirit witnessed to my spirit. But Lord, it was, in addition to that, it was exciting to know that you had something in mind you wanted me to do for you in ministering to that young man who was hitchhiking. What a joy it was to watch you work in his life. You were so visible then. But Lord, thank you for reminding me that um, there are other times when you're not as visible, but you're still just as real. In those times of deep grief, when we're hurting right down to the bottom of our spirits, and we can't see you, but you teach us how to walk by faith and not by sight. In those times when our hopes are crushed and we feel like we're going to die, you restore hope because you are our hope. Our hope is in you and not in the situations around us. Lord, I ask your forgiveness for those times when I'm slow to believe you mean what you say in your word. Thank you for teaching me that you do mean it and that you will fulfill it. I praise your name for your presence here this morning. I know you're here, not because I see you, but because you said you would be with your people when they gather in your name, even two or three. And you're faithful to your word, and I believe that, so I want to thank you for your presence. I want to thank you for touching each of our lives at that point of need or point of joy. And ministering to our grief and restoring our hope and strengthening our belief. As we walk through this week together, Lord, I thank you for revealing yourself to us in so many and various ways. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear. In Jesus' name, amen.